Hello, Dark Case family. Welcome home. First off, if you want to skip the intro and get straight into the video, then the timestamp is down below, and I'll see you there. I have been blown away by the response to this Things You May Later Regret Knowing series so far. Trying new things on YouTube is always pretty risky behaviour, so thank you all for supporting it, for supporting me, and for being here right now too. And while you are here, I'd love to hear your thoughts, comments or suggestions on the series. I really do want this to be the best thing I've ever done, so please share your thoughts down in the comments. It's also warmed my heart to see so many of you resonate as being forgotten, forsaken, outcasts, and that everyone here seems to have been through something that has led us to the darker side of YouTube. I always had a feeling deep inside that that is what brought us together and you all really confirmed it. And that's why this community that we have built together is called the Dark Case Family. A lot of us need somewhere to belong outside of the everyday life that we live, or maybe even to escape the everyday life that we could be stuck in. And for me, that escape or that place of belonging is right here with you guys. And even if your life is going good, then it's still easy to get overwhelmed. It's a stressful world with a lot of insane stuff going on pretty constantly. So please just lean on each other as much as you can. And just in case nobody has said this to you for a while, everything will be okay. And remember, it really helps me out if you hit subscribe and turn on notifications too. That way we can all kind of just stay in touch a lot easier. And in case you didn't know, I release dark documentaries, at least one a week, where I bring you true crime, disturbing stories, and other things that you may later regret. It was a year marked by big moments. The ongoing Cold War with Russia, the continuation of Reaganomics, when the president aimed to boost the nation's income by using trickle-down economics. We're still waiting on that, by the way. And the year where a small event that doesn't usually become national news, like a family picnic on a mountain, would end up becoming part of history forever. Nileen K. Briscoe was born on the 8th of September 1978 in Orange County, California. By 1983, her parents had split up. Mother Nancy was now with stepfather Kim Marshall. And so Nileen became Nileen Marshall. Her biological father, William Roy Briscoe, was in the picture, but he was a non custodial parent. June 25th, 1983 was a Saturday. And this meant that Nileen, now four years old, was with her mother, stepfather and two siblings, Nathan, six, and Noreen, two. They were taking advantage of a chance to all be together on this beautiful summer's day. But only four of the five would return home. The local radio station, Capital City Radio, had invited the family to an amateur radio operator's picnic. This was situated in a remote part of the Elkhorn Mountains pretty near to their hometown of Clancy. Here on this inactive volcano range in southwest Montana, wild elk can be seen roaming all year long, and when the sun shines down, its light catches and brightens the green leaves of the dense trees that cover the hillsides. No one could have known that this picture-perfect scene would soon shatter in only seconds a mere few hours later. Nileen had picked out a yellow t-shirt and shorts to wear that morning. Her outfit matched the bright mood of the picnic, as the adults unfolded blankets and laid out food for everyone to share. People passed around sandwiches and chatted as they stretched out. No one else could be seen around them. Their chosen spot was completely secluded. In between lulls of conversation, the only sounds that could be heard was the whispering of trees as they swayed in the wind. After a while, the children, growing restless from sitting down for too long, asked the adults if they could go and play in the creek. 
and the adults didn't think twice about letting them do so. The general feeling was that no harm could come to them in this quiet part of the mountains. Or so they all thought. It was around 4pm when they set off, a time that would only become significant later when the parents had to report it. Nileen, her siblings and some of the other children attending the picnic headed down to the stream, longing to put their feet in the water to cool off. As the others ran ahead, Nileen, now getting tired, sat to rest on a pile of rocks near the dams that the beavers had built. Wait here, one of the other children told her, we'll be right back. Nileen nodded, grateful to have a chance to pause, a chance to sit and enjoy the peace and quiet of a beautiful day in a beautiful place. So she was left alone and the others moved onwards. When the older girl came back only moments later, Nileen was gone. Nileen, the children called, hoping she was just around the corner. Nileen, they called more loudly. But they saw no trace of her and she didn't call back. They tried again and still nothing. They ran back to their families. They returned to the picnic site that just moments earlier had been the scene of such a pleasant Saturday. But the kids were now crying, afraid of why they couldn't find Nileen anywhere. Where could she have gone? The adults instantly panicked and immediately took to the area to search. As they did, some of them started to look nervously at the rocky cliffs on the edges of the mountains, the ones that dropped off for hundreds of feet. Others looked in an old mine shaft. A little girl could wander in there and tumble. She could perhaps have twisted her ankle and now not be able to move. They noticed all these little things that they hadn't accounted for when the children first asked to play. They now searched more intensively, splintering off to cover more ground. But still, they couldn't find the four-year-old anywhere. Desperation now growing, they called the police. Their wailing sirens quickly cut through the normally peaceful and serene area. Food was strewn across the picnic blankets. Half-eaten bites put down as the adults scrambled to search for the little girl. The cars quickly followed old trail roads, slowing at the twists and turns before finally arriving. Police officers interviewed each person at the picnic. When was the last time you saw Nileen? Around 4pm. What was she doing before you last saw her? Sitting on the rocks, over there. Does she have a tendency to wander away? No, she always wants to stay close to us. Was anyone else around other than who's here? No, the adults started. But here, some of the children paused. One started to nod very slowly. The six-year-old whispered, There was a man around before. I remember because he was wearing a purple jogging suit. It stood out. Nileen said that the man told her to follow the shadow. The police. Everyone held their breath. Could this have been the man who took Nileen? Did he trick her to follow a shadow? Maybe his shadow only to then take her? And if so, where was he? Who was he? And where was Nileen? The police search escalated, but as night fell, Nileen was still nowhere to be seen. 2,800 volunteers joined in the search. Helicopters whirred in the sky above and dogs fanned out in front of them. The canines' noses picked up a scent near Morpin Creek. They followed it, barking loudly. And then, just as suddenly as it had been detected, it heartbreakingly stopped. Infrared heat sensors too found no trace. Silently, the feeling within the police force began to wonder if she had indeed been kidnapped. They called in more specialised search teams. These are people entrusted to find people even in the hardest of circumstances. They combed through the mine shafts and the ponds where lava used to once bubble up. And even though, decades before, people had successfully searched the mountain for silver and gold, mining for profit, after 10 days the search for Nileen did not go the same way. Here there was no reward to be found. Ken Gardner was one of those volunteers. Archive news clippings detail the efforts of him and hundreds of others. You stretch your hands out, so my arm out to your arm to his arm. Grid searches, huge areas, huge areas of grid searches, nothing. Five days in and the weather turned, and so did the mood, but not their resolve. 
by now you're cold and the weather's bad and you've lost this hope that, that you're going to find her, at least find her alive. But you also get this, maybe today. Maybe there's something today. The marshal's little girl, with her distinct chipped baby tooth when she smiled, had vanished. The search was eventually called off. There was nothing more that could be done on the mountain. At home, without their daughter, the parents would look at Nileen's bed, wondering if she would ever sleep in it again. They hoped that she'd make it home before her fifth birthday. They handed out thousands of missing person flies across the country to help to bring her home, almost in disbelief that the person missing was their very own daughter. A devastatingly surreal situation. Meanwhile, the shadow man stayed the main suspect for the police. But just as the daylight disappeared on that first day, so too had all traces of the man. Two agonising years passed with no news and no new updates. No one responded to the flyers with any helpful information. The marshal's other daughter, Noreen, turned four, the very same age as Nileen when she disappeared. As they cut the cake, trying to pretend this was another normal birthday, they all noticed the absence of Nileen's happy giggle around the table. 1985 started with the inauguration of President Reagan's second term, and at almost the end of the year, on a cold November night, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children received an anonymous phone call. There was information on Nileen for the first time since she had gone missing. I have Nileen, the caller whispered. The operator was in shock. I found her on a road in Elkhorn, so I picked her up and took her home with me. Just as the operator was about to ask more questions, the call went dead. The mystery man hung up. This was the first meaningful clue since Nileen had disappeared. Obviously frantic, the parents hoped that the call could be traced but the police found nothing. Then, two months later, a different organisation called Child Find of America received another communication. This time, it was a typewritten letter. It started as if they'd already been having a conversation. I believe this first excerpt is following on from that first phone call. The anonymous author wrote, I didn't want their person to try to get information from her. All I could tell them was that she was okay. I hope Child Find can get the following back to her family. I picked Kay up on the road in the Elkhorn Park area, between Helena and Boulder. She was crying and frightened, and as I held her, she was shaking, and I decided that I would keep her and love her. I took her home with me. But the police and Nileen's family knew better. Some of what the man described he was doing did not sound good. This excerpt is the most disturbing. It starts with a man telling us he gives Nileen a medicine every morning, but the truth is just abhorrent. I get it from the bathroom every morning. It is actually a spoonful of my son. It doesn't affect her physically. I have never murdered her in any other way. She is a sweet little girl, and it's because of how much I've grown to love her that I realise how much her family must miss her. But she is adjusted and seems happy. She trusts me and isn't afraid. We play a lot and she laughs when we clown around. She smiles and acts coy when I tease her. She giggles when we snuggle and she hugs me sometimes for no apparent reason. I love her and I have her. I just can't let her go. Their daughter belonged in only one place and that was home with her family. After the letter came what the family was agonisingly all too familiar with, more silence. Then slowly, over the next six months, two more letters came, as well as occasional phone calls. The postmarks were from Madison, Wisconsin, many states away from Montana, a state that Nileen had never been to. One of the letters said, She would gladly recount to you trips to San Francisco, New York, Oklahoma City, New Orleans, Nashville, Chicago, Puerto Rico and Canada. We were even in Britain for a month last year and she loved it. Nobody questions passports. How this person could have supposedly taken Nileen out of the country, the family wondered. I have a nice investment income. 
and I can work at home, so I care for her myself all the time. I teach her at home, and she likes to go with me when I travel. Her hair is short and curly now, and she has really grown. She is about 45 inches and around 50 pounds. She has all four of her permanent upper and two of her lower incisors at this time. She takes a bath and brushes her hair every day. She eats well. Her favourite meal is pizza and cherry cola. I call her Kay. I'm raising her as my own child. Her parents were distraught. Was their daughter really alive? Were these letters even real? The FBI managed to trace the calls back to phone booths in Madison, but as soon as they found out where they were coming from, they suddenly stopped. This new silence was harder for the family than the news that at least maybe Nileen was still out there, somewhere, and the trail again had gone cold. More years passed. Nileen's siblings continued growing up, going to school, and making core childhood memories without their sister. Her parents tried, as much as they could, to hold on to hope that Nileen could still walk through the front door at any moment, that she would somehow, someday, return home. For them, ever since that afternoon on the mountain, time seemed to have stood still. What would their daughter even look like now, after all this time? Would she still have that chip on her tooth? Would yellow still be her favourite colour? Would she remember who they were? Other local families remembered Nileen's disappearance too, keeping a closer eye on their children, fearful that the same could happen to theirs. And then, six years later, when the family had slowly started to accept that there may never be any more clues, there came another shock, a surprise confession. A 42-year-old man who had prior convictions for violations said that he had ended Nileen's time on this earth as well as that of another woman. But after being held for a week by the police, he was let go. Regardless of the confession, there wasn't enough evidence to hold him. In 1990, the famous true crime show Unsolved Mysteries aired a segment on Nileen's case. This sparked a renewed interest, one that would both refresh people's memories, as well as introduce them to the case for the first time. A truly unbelievable discovery would come following the TV show airing. A hotline tip was received from a school student in Bellingham, Washington. They were certain that a girl in their class was Nileen Marshall. The age matched up. Her sudden arrival at the school made sense with Nileen's story and the girl looked very much like her. Police promptly investigated and they discovered even more than they bargained for. The girl was a missing person. She had been born in California before vanishing. She had been kidnapped by her non-custodial father, going missing in 1982 with the case going quickly cold. The girl was identified, bringing the case to a close. But it wasn't Nileen Marshall. The girl was named Monica Bonilla, and she was finally reunited with her rightful family members. So the Marshalls had to regroup and, once more, building up their strength after it had once again been drained by disappointing developments. As if the pain of not finding Nileen was not hard enough for the Marshalls, a second tragedy hit in 1995. Nileen's mother was discovered deceased in a Mexico City hotel room. And although police would initially say it was self-inflicted, the case was later changed to under investigation, but no other leads came through. Nileen's family tried to navigate their way through losing both their sister and their mother, their daughter and their wife. How much pain could visit just one family? But in 1998, there was one last potential hope. A 19-year-old woman, originally from Oklahoma, came to a New Orleans hospital to give birth. Was this woman Nileen Marshall? The staff thought that she shared the same facial features, the features of that little girl they had seen on public broadcasts all those years ago. Her nose, her eyes, they all looked similar. Hopeful that this case was finally cracked, they asked to test her blood to compare it with her mother's. Everyone waited for the test results with bated breath. Was this about to be the end of the mystery that had haunted the Marshalls for all these years? 
The nurse read the outcome in a small, dimly lit room. It read, Not a match. And the case had gone cold again. All these years later, Nylene would now be 46 years old. But did she get to grow up? Did she get to see the world because of the man who had taken her? Or did she never leave Elkhorn Mountain after all? Her remaining family often think back to that last journey they made all together on that summer day where the heat made the back of their legs stick to the seats, of how they strapped Nylene into the back seat, letting her hold onto her stuffed toy for the journey, of her excitement at the picnic to spend time as a family, the simplicity of her thinking that at the end of the day, her parents would tuck her in and read the bedtime story as they usually did before they whispered goodnight how she probably hoped for pancakes on Sunday morning. All of these small dreams of a four-year-old girl that would never come true. All that was left behind was emptiness. Empty mine shafts, her empty bedroom, an empty car seat on the journey home, and an emptiness in the hearts of everyone that loved her. I've got nothing to do with the abduction of James Lavis, and I've got the backing of the Lavis family, relations, Everybody. Jamie Aaron Lavis was born on the 16th of March 1989. The fact that Jamie was born a healthy little boy was just short of a miracle. Jamie was in fact one of twins, but sadly his brother was lost in utero. He was in many ways a typical young lad, described by his mother as being cheeky, funny, and as making everyone happy. He was well known and liked in the local community, and he enjoyed spending time outside with his older brother, John. The Lavis family are from the suburb of Openshaw in Greater Manchester. It is a working class area near the centre of the city. While at the time the suburb was considered a little rough, it was common for children to be playing out in the streets most days. Jamie was known for being mischievous, playful and boisterous, and in an interview with a local news station, his mother Karen recounted how he would have breakfast with his father John at 6am after the hard-working man had gotten in from his night shift and then go on to win a second helping. He'd simply tell her that he hadn't eaten yet. She lovingly called him comical, a proper character. His sister described him as cute and sweet with a smile that melted people's hearts. Jamie was one of five children, and despite his endless energy, he never strayed too far. For instance, as he was afraid of the dark, he was always home by tea time. However, on May the 5th, 1997, which was a national bank holiday, Jamie strangely failed to return home for tea. It was a particularly grey and wet day and his mother was immediately alarmed. She knew that her boy would never come home late, and he loved his food. Jamie's father arrived home a few hours later and he was initially reluctant to panic. He tried to keep his wife calm, claiming she was being overly sensitive, but by the time 9pm and then 10pm rolled around, the whole family knew that something was very very wrong. They all went out looking for him. They felt especially concerned because Jamie was pretty small. Although he was eight years old at the time, his clothing size was aged five to six and he was only four foot tall. Remember, he was one of twins. His family worried that he was too small to defend himself against other kids, let alone anyone bigger. The Lavis family searched for hours, but Jamie was nowhere to be found. The seeds of concern grew quickly into a huge, dark, imposing fear. So eventually, they called the police. And so unfolded one of the more disturbing cases in Manchester's long history. Neighbourhood search parties took to the streets, and very soon local news shows were involved. The Lavis family begged for Jamie's safe return. If anybody out there knows where Jamie is or he's giving him food, please just get in touch with the police. Everybody's waiting for him to come home. Now, Jamie's described as being small for his age. He's about four foot tall and he wears, he wears clothes 
that are made to fit a five to six year old. Multiple tips and sightings started flooding in. Several people said they had seen Jamie catching the 219 bus that morning. He was apparently off to town to buy his mother a birthday present. Superintendent Roy Rainford, now retired, was the senior investigator on Jamie's case. He described the 219 bus route as one that Jamie often took, jumping aboard as he got up to his many little adventures. This made the Openshaw buses the first hotspot of the investigation. The particular bus route stopped near several derelict houses that children used to play in. This concerned Rainford because it meant there were many abandoned buildings to search through and that there were ample empty spaces to hide something nefarious. CCTV footage showed that Jamie had in fact entered the bus station at around 10.30am that morning, but this was the last footage that they could find. It was almost as if from the bus station, Jamie vanished into thin air. The hours rolled on. The investigation seemed to be leading nowhere. The Lavis family were becoming more and more distraught. Until a glimmer of hope. Around 24 hours after Jamie's disappearance, a local bus driver approached the family. He informed them that Jamie had been on his bus the day that he went missing. He even confirmed that Jamie was wearing a dark blue Reebok tracksuit. And, grateful for the first lead of the case, the family felt that this man could be the key to bringing Jamie home. Darren Vickers, a 28-year-old bus driver, was the last person to see Jamie before he vanished in May of 1997. Darren only lived a few houses down from the Lavis family, and he told the police that Jamie had spent all day on his bus the day that he went missing. He also said that Jamie had purchased a day saver ticket, a ticket that gives you unlimited travel within a certain area, and that he eventually got off at the Ashton bus station near their home. The family were frantic and desperate for answers, and Darren was the closest tie they had to their missing son. Soon, Darren began integrating himself into the family's lives, spending days on end in their home to help with the investigation. He claimed that he felt guilty, having been the last point of contact with Jamie. He felt that he had a responsibility to the family and to Jamie, so the Lavis family embraced him as a good Samaritan, as someone who was both willing and able to help them when they needed it the most. Darren also started to talk to the media. He gave several interviews with local news stations. He stated that whoever was keeping a boy of that age was sick and that they needed to send him home. He also told the media that, unlike the police, he did not believe that Jamie was no longer alive. There's somebody out there has got to be sick keeping a child of that age. You know, it shouldn't be done. If you had any respect, you just hand him over to the nearest police station. Just let the child go in. Just let him come home. He's not in trouble. He's not nothing. He's just wanted. I feel he's still alive. I don't fear the same way the police fear that he's murdered. His family don't. But somebody somewhere knows where Jamie is. Could never dream of it. A young child on the bus like that. You know, just going missing. It's just unbearable to think about. It's just a nightmare for everyone. We just got close. It's like one big close family now because we've been out, we've been out virtually 24 hours a day. All of us involved looking for Jamie. He even took part in a police reconstruction of the day that Jamie went missing. Darren now acted as the unofficial spokesperson when the family couldn't face the media. One officer even described him ominously as their kingpin. He began thinking of himself as their pillar of strength. He would lead search parties looking for the boy. The family soon became emotionally dependent on Darren. The more he placed himself at the center of the case, the more unnerved people around the family became. Community members found his new fixation odd, and soon the police became suspicious as well. It also became increasingly difficult for the police to share information and updates with the family, that is, without it quickly filtering through to Darren. Some officers felt that the Lavis family trusted Darren more than they trusted the police, and who could blame them? 
Darren had moved in with the family, even though he had his own family just a few doors down. Despite the police's frustrations and their suspicions, they had no evidence or strong leads, and the case seemed to reach a deadlock. However, slowly, witness accounts of Jamie's last day started trickling in from people on the bus, and all of them varied starkly from Darren's story. He had described Jamie as just another passenger on the bus. However, several other eyewitness accounts said that this was simply not true. Jamie was described as having turned the bus into a playground. He was collecting tickets and changing the gears of the bus. Police also noted that a lone child couldn't purchase a day saver ticket. And due to these mounting holes in the story, Darren now became the prime suspect. Investigators started pouring through hours of CCTV footage, and it was then they discovered something unsettling. While it was true that Jamie arrived at the bus station that morning at around 10.30am, he didn't simply get on a bus. Rather, Jamie was approached by a man who can be seen ruffling his hair. And that man in the footage was... Darren Vickers. The police immediately ran a background check on Darren. They discovered at the time of Jamie's disappearance, he had only been working as a bus driver for a few days. On his CV, most of his references were simply fake and he had made them up, except for one. And that one person was a convicted pedophile. With their new discoveries backing their investigation, the police were able to arrest Darren Vickers on the 24th of May 1997. This was approximately three weeks from Jamie's disappearance. Shockingly, the Lavis family were appalled by the arrest. They blamed the police as being desperate and having no other leads. They still felt that Darren was their friend, and maybe more than that, To them, he had been their hero throughout this emotional trauma. And perhaps Jamie's family did actually have a point. The evidence against Darren was, in reality, pretty weak. And so police were unable to charge him. Darren was released. He was welcomed home and fully embraced once again by the Lavis family. Not only were they waiting for him at the station when he was released, but they even threw him a party. Backed by the family's strong support, Darren's confidence escalated. He now even called into a local Manchester radio station to discuss the case. And again, he stated that he believed Jamie was still alive, and that if he weren't, they would have found his body by now. Well, I was coming back from Manchester, and I said to him that uh, I'm going to have to start you back off now, because this is my last run up. Jamie turned around and said to me, but my mum and dad's not in, I've got nowhere to go. Then I said to him, well, since I only live around the corner from me, I can take you back to the depot and drop you off when I go home. He was over the moon about it, he said, yeah. I said, are you sure you're going to be okay? He said, yeah. That was the last we saw of him. So how's the police investigation going, Darren? The police are not letting much information out about that. Which the family is supposed to know, you know, the first confirmed sighting. Yeah. It, we've never been told. I'll never know till the day he comes home. Mm. I still believe he's alive. If the case was what the police are making out to be, if the case was he was dead, round where they're looking, if they found him, you know. Darren's behaviour was starting to rouse suspicion from those close to the case, but still seemingly not with Karen or John. Darren then shockingly invited a camera crew into the Lavis family's home. This was all an attempt to clear his name. In the clips, he can be seen explicitly stating, I've got nothing to do with the abduction of James Lavis. I've got the backing of the Lavis family, relations, everybody. And so the investigation rolled frustratingly on. I've got nothing to do with the abduction of James Lavis. And I've got the backing of the Lavis family, relations, everybody. In a stroke of luck, a few months later, Darren Vickers was arrested for outstanding driving offences and kept in prison for 10 weeks. This finally gave the police time to focus on the investigation without Darren's interference. Jamie's family can now be spoken to by the police in peace. Perhaps this distance would generate some new information. And it did. 
Before his arrest, Darren would take Jamie's older brother, John Jr., on day trips on several bus routes. Since John Jr. and Jamie were similar sizes and close in age, police came to believe that Darren was trying to elicit false sightings, confusing the case even further and putting distance between himself and Jamie. Darren had also used the scanner to track police reports. He would show up at possible sightings with Jamie's mother. This behaviour was disruptive, to say the least. Most importantly at this time, with Darren in jail, the police could access the Lavis family free from Darren's manipulative hold. At this time, the Lavis family started to reconsider their relationship with Darren. And by October, the police finally had enough circumstantial evidence along with the family's new backing, to arrest and charge Darren Vickers with the abduction of Jamie Lavis. Still though, investigators were determined to charge Darren with murder as well. Even though he was already under arrest, they continued the frantic search for Jamie's body. It was now that they received several tips that Darren had been to a particular part of a park called Reddish Vale. And shockingly, not only had Darren been to the park, but according to Sergeant Rainford, he had brought several children to the park at midnight. These children recognised Darren from the media appearances that he had placed himself in, and they then went to the police. The children said that Darren showed them a picture of Jamie. He then pointed whilst claiming to see him. This understandably scared the children, and they ran away, frightened. It was also reported that Darren brought Jamie's older brother John Jr. to the same spot in the park. He then gave him a cigarette and told him, This is where your Jamie is, and if you don't behave yourself, I'll throw you in. Finally, near to where Darren had brought the children and Jamie's own brother, situated in a dense and overgrown part of the park, just off of the footpath, police found an item of children's clothing. It was the tracksuit bottoms that Jamie had been wearing on the day that he went missing. Investigators took the clothing for forensic testing and, carefully wrapped inside an item of clothing, they found a small jawbone. Other bones were found scattered around the park. DNA testing of milk teeth proved that the remains did belong to Jamie Lavis. Darren was now charged with abduction and murder. Police believe that after his shift, Darren lured Jamie into his car. He then violated him and ended his short time on this earth. Darren pled not guilty. During the trial, he claimed that Jamie's father was in fact the murderer, and that he himself was having an affair with Jamie's mother Karen, and that she was carrying his child. Karen was indeed pregnant at the time. She was forced to take a blood test to prove that the baby was not fathered by Darren. Darren's defence was, it turns out, totally fabricated. He was unanimously found guilty. Darren Vickers was charged to life in prison with a minimum term of 25 years. But even still, his vile manipulation and fascination with the media knew no bounds. He now confessed to the murder and violation of Jamie Lavis. However, he then contacted the media just a few days later and publicly retracted his confession. Several officers that worked on the case believed that Darren Vickers would have gone on to become a serial killer were he not imprisoned. Darren was up for parole in 2023, but he was thankfully refused. Tragically, Jamie's older brother, John Jr., ended his own time on this earth at age 31. The Lavis family think of Jamie every day, and Mother Karen still writes poems about her son to this very day. Love is a big emotion. It drives many urges and fuels us to do things we may not normally do. It has the power to mend or break hearts, 
and in many ways it can push us to our limits. It is unsurprising then that we often encounter impulsive crimes of passion between couples. This is a story of unrequited love and humiliation that seemingly pushed a man to the edge. This polarizing case, however, mixes love with entertainment, a combination that would prove to be deadly. Now, which of these ways would you choose to reveal your secret crush on someone? A, would you write that person a letter? B, would you tell the person in private in case he rejects you? Or C, would you tell that person that you're gay and you hope he is on national television? <laughs> On January the 26th, 1963, Scott Amadure was born in Pittsburgh, Minnesota to Frank and Patricia. The family moved to Michigan, and unfortunately, shortly after this, Frank and Patricia separated. This left the kids to be raised alone by their truck driving father. One of the boys, named Scott, was a high school dropout. He left to join the army early on. There, he served three years, making it to the rank of specialist, before returning to Michigan following an honorable discharge. As he grew, Scott lived a quiet life, but was described to be a social butterfly by everyone around him. His chatty nature served him well. He found himself in a telesales role, and he worked that job for a short period following his time in the forces. However, he would later take a bartending position at Club Flamingo in Pontiac, a job that suited him and his social nature down to the ground. Scott, now 34 years old, was proudly gay, and Club Flamingo was a gay bar. Remember, we are talking about the early 90s here, so attitudes towards him were different than the modern day. The decades preceding the early 90s and the height of HIV and AIDS awareness meant that perceptions of the LGBTQ plus community were far different than what we see in society now. At a time when the world held very judgmental views, Scott seemed to be one of the lucky few who had a family that loved him and supported him regardless. As well as them, he had plenty of friends too. Scott became good friends with a woman named Donna Riley. She lived in the same apartment complex as his brother, who he would visit regularly. On one of these visits, he would encounter 24-year-old Jonathan Schmitz. He was a close friend of Donna's too, and he was working on her car. Scott struck up a casual conversation, and through their mutual friend Donna, the three would begin to occasionally hang out. However, it would soon become apparent that Scott was interested in more than just friendship from the 24-year-old. But to try and understand what happens next, we need to go back in time three or four months and take a look at a national TV show that would light a fire that just couldn't be put out. The show was one of Scott's favourite talk shows to be exact. The Jenny Jones show followed the typical format of the myriad of chat shows that rose to popularity in the early 90s. They were cheap and easy to pump out, a rinse and repeat type show that made a producer rub their hands in glee as they watched their ratings soar. Think the Jerry Springer show, but less fake. And nothing boosted viewers like scandals and secrets. The juicier and more controversial, the better. And the ratings would have certainly soared the day that Scott, Donna and Jonathan appeared as Jenny Jones' guests for some jaw-dropping revelations. Only the episode shot on the 6th of March 1991 in front of a live studio audience would never make it to air, and for good reason. The pre-taped broadcast became the catalyst that led one of them to do the unthinkable. Jonathan asked to participate in an episode where his crush would be revealed, although in a twist he was told it could be a man or a woman. However, later paperwork evidence would reveal that he was coerced into believing the latter. He identified as straight and expressed a lack of interest if there was a man involved. However, this episode of Jenny Jones was entitled Same Sex Crushes, so that should have been a pretty strong clue as to what could have been happening on the chat show stage. Any televised crush revelation from a friend you had no interest in could and probably would lead to embarrassment, regardless of the genders involved. 
So Scott's decision to reply to be on the show was an intriguing one. In the back of his mind, the ex-army specialist must have known it might make things uncomfortable. At certain times, we all take chances, but no one could have predicted just how quickly things would escalate. In the episode footage that would later be shown in court, Jonathan waited backstage to meet his crush. He was hoping it was his ex-girlfriend wanting him back in her life. Instead, on stage, Scott admits his attraction for the guy waiting backstage, describing his first encounter with Jonathan's lower half beneath Donna's car. When he is asked about Jonathan's orientation, he replies that... No. Anything's possible. Okay, you think about it, you, you have fantasies about him? I've had a couple, yeah. Yeah, you had one, you had, when he was under the car, you had a fantasy about him. Yeah, something to do with, like, brake oil, line snapping, and... <laughs> Tell us yeah. about, you have another one uh, that involved, you're in a hammock or something? Tell us about that fantasy. He then went on to share a detailed fantasy that he wanted to try, when it included a hammock, champagne, and whipped cream. Really, it's tickle. Get the headphones off of John, and let's have John come out here oh, and right see now. who has the crush on him. Here's John. <laughs> When Jonathan finally made his appearance and sees his friends, he notably slows, but he does paste a large smile onto his face. Knowing what we know now, this was probably just for the audience and the cameras. He must have been confused and maybe a little irritated because as we would later learn, he had actually asked the pair if they knew anything about the show when he had initially been invited by the production. 24-year-old Jonathan appears to take things well, on the surface at least. He kisses Donna and offers Scott to shake his hand. But Scott quickly pulls him in for a hug that Jonathan notably tries not to participate in. He takes a seat next to Scott, with his smile still masking his obvious discomfort. The host tries to stretch out the suspense by asking him if he thinks Donna could be his crush. Did you think Donna had the crush on you? Did I? No, we're good friends. Jonathan, sensing the situation, disagrees. She moves quickly on to reveal it was actually Scott who wanted the relationship. Well, guess what? It's Scott that has the crush on you. You lied to me. (laughs) To which Jonathan says, You lied to me. Possibly this was to his friends, or perhaps it was to the production team who had led him to believe he was meeting a female love interest. Jonathan had told the team he had no interest in being involved in the show, if the crush turned out to be male, and yet here he was, with hundreds of onlookers. There was deception here, and it could definitely be seen as frustrating or even humiliating due to the public setting, but this is no excuse for how the story ends. Jonathan doesn't seem too perplexed as he tactfully reaffirms his disinterest in a relationship with Scott. He insists that whilst it is flattering, he himself is straight and only attracted to women. Scott too handles the rejection well, and the segment doesn't really have much more to it. After the show, the three of them reportedly hung out in Chicago, and with this water seemingly under the bridge, Jonathan even suggested they all fly home together. Back in Michigan, they all went out partying in a bar, and there appeared to be no bad blood. But three days after taping, on March the 9th, 1995, Jonathan returned home from work to a very suggestive note and a gift outside his door. This note, he said, sent him into what he described as gay panic. The note seemingly caused such a reaction within Jonathan that he withdrew cash, purchased a 12-gauge shotgun, and then drove to Scott's trailer. Jonathan initially knocked on a door, unarmed, to confront Scott. Scott had company, a friend named Gary at the time, but he invited him in. Jonathan, though, was undeterred by Gary's presence, and he asked whether it was Scott that had left the note. Scott confirmed it was, and Jonathan went outside to turn off his engine. As he left for his car, he closed the front door behind him. When he knocked the second time, he faced Scott with a loaded weapon. Scott yelled to his friend Gary for help, and Gary valiantly picked up the only thing to hand, a wicker chair. But before he could help, Scott was hit twice in the chest, the trigger pulled by his crush. This act would end Scott's time on this earth. According to Gary, Jonathan then left immediately. Gary went on to quickly call emergency services, 
Gary then dialed 911. In a moment of rationality that immediately followed, 24-year-old Jonathan also dialed 911 himself. and appeared in court a year later. During the trial, his mental state was questioned heavily. They needed to determine whether the event was premeditated. The prosecution insisted that the purchasing, construction, loading and driving over to Scott's house was proof enough. The defence argued that he suffered temporary insanity due to gay panic, and this was a result of the revelation shared on a talk show, brought back by the note. They also leaned heavily on a bipolar diagnosis and a tough childhood that had seen him punished for tiny things, leaving him with mental fragility that they claimed led to his extreme actions. The premeditation was initially stated by Jonathan himself at the police station during interview, but the recordings were deemed inadmissible in court. This was because his Miranda rights hadn't been delivered correctly. Jonathan was then sentenced to 25 to 50 years in prison for his actions. He did appeal this decision, but it was overturned. Scott's family, disgusted with the show's actions, went after Warner Brothers in court. They blamed the Jenny Jones production for pushing Jonathan to the very edge. During the trial, they tried to prove that the show intended to humiliate the pair for ratings. But Warner, despite admitting it was morally grey at times, insisted that they were neither legally nor financially responsible for Scott's passing. However, the jury that day, after seeing the unaired episode for themselves, believed that the Jenny Jones show had played a huge part. Warner was ordered to pay a huge settlement. The payout was to be more than $20 million. However, the ruling was eventually overturned. The family never saw a penny. Jonathan Schmitz was released on bail in August of 2017. He was released early on good behaviour. There are few words as horrifying in the English language as you have cancer. And horrifically, these are words that 50% of us will hear in our lifetime. And at that point, you are pretty much at the mercy of medical professionals. If you are fortunate enough to have a chance of recovery, then you really have to put your trust in the process laid out in front of you. Whatever happens, the road won't be easy. But what if your treatment didn't just have side effects, but it was the thing that would end your journey in the worst possible way? It was the 3rd of June 1985, 61-year-old Katie Yarborough visited the Kennestone Regional Oncology Center in Marietta, Georgia. She was to undergo radiation treatment following a lumpectomy. She was prepped for electron treatment to her clavicle. The machine used for Katie's treatment was the Therac-25. The purpose of the Therac-25 was to deliver highly targeted radiation therapy. It was computer controlled, meaning data was input into it, and then it essentially did its thing. The radiation blasting robot hummed to life, and then Katie felt an intense, searing heat. You've burned me, she cried, but the technician insisted that that was simply impossible. There were no visible burn marks on her skin, just a warm lingering on the surface. The treatment finished and Katie returned home. But soon, her pain escalated, her shoulder froze into position, and an angry red swelling spread through to her back, her skin peeling away in agony. The investigation revealed she had been exposed to a staggering radiation overdose. It was potentially as high as 20,000 rads. Typical doses for this treatment were normally no higher than 200. As an idea of how serious this actually was, just 1,000 rads can be considered a lethal dose. 
The patient was extremely lucky to escape this incident with her life. However, she still bears the lifelong impacts of this incident. Part of her chest had to be removed. Her shoulder, along with her arm, remained in an essentially paralysed state. And Katie now had to live her life in chronic pain. And although her life had been in one way saved, she had also suffered a hugely traumatic and negative experience at the hands of this machine. Nobody involved wanted any of this to have happened. A lawsuit was raised and then settled out of court. At the Ontario Cancer Foundation, Therac 25 had been in operation for six months. It was a regular day, July the 26th, 1985. A 40-year-old woman walked in for her 24th treatment for cervical cancer. The patient, who was ready for her treatment, settled down onto the table. The technician, familiar with the routine, initiated the treatment. But within five seconds, the machine stopped. An error message flashed. It said, H-tilt. The operator looked at the decimeter, and it showed that no radiation had been applied. They then pressed the P key to proceed, but the machine halted again, and again, and again. It did this five times in total before the treatment was aborted. At this point, a technician was called in to perform a thorough check. However, no issues were found with the machine. The Therac 25 continued to treat six more patients that day, all without a hitch. Perhaps this time it was a harmless issue, or maybe user error, but no such luck. Four days later, the woman returned, and now she was complaining of severe burning and swelling in her lower abdomen. Due to obvious concerns, the woman was hospitalised. Medical professionals suspected a severe radiation overdose. The woman had, in a way, been cooked from the inside. This led to the Therac 25 machine temporarily being taken out of service. However, this action could not undo what was already done. On November the 3rd, 1985, the female patient passed away. Her autopsy revealed devastating facts. Even if she had survived her original illness and this medical disaster, she would have needed a hip replacement due to the radiation overdose. An overdose that was estimated to be between 13,000 and 17,000 rad. The incident was reported to the FDA and to the Canadian Radiation Protection Bureau. The manufacturer of the Therac 25, AECL, suspected a fault with the micro switches. However, when they tried to confirm the malfunction, they simply couldn't replicate the issue. So whatever happened was just an anomaly. They went on to modify the software, claiming a five order of magnitude increase in safety. But the dark shadow of the Therac 25 had only just begun to spread. Fast forward to December 1985, we are now at the Yakima Valley Memorial Hospital. A female patient developed a strange erythema after her treatment with the Therac 25. An erythema is basically a red patch, probably caused by trauma. The redness is due to increased blood supply and dilation of blood vessels. The hospital reported this incident to AECL. The company then confidently replied that a radiation overdose was pretty much impossible. The letter sent by the AECL in response stated that a Therac 25 overdose was not possible without a machine failure or operator error. Yet, six months later, the woman developed chronic ulcers and worse, tissue necrosis something that can be caused by radiation. The woman underwent surgery to try and rectify her medical issues. However, only a limited amount could be done. And she did live on, but she was plagued with persistent reminders of her ordeal. East Texas Cancer Center, March 21, 1986. Here, the Therac 25 had treated over 500 patients without incident. But that day, a patient came for his ninth treatment for a tumour situated on his back. The machine operator, known to be experienced and meticulous, accidentally entered an X instead of an E for the treatment type. 
but she realized her error and corrected it. The machine then displayed the message, raise, ready, crisis averted. Or was it? As soon as she hit the B key, the machine stopped with a malfunction 54 error message. The decimeter showed that a relatively low dose of radiation was delivered. The operator, undeterred by the previous message, pressed P to proceed. Again, the machine stopped with the same error. Inside the treatment room, the patient felt a sharp electric shock, and he began to get up. But as he did, the operator pressed P once more, and another jolt was delivered. This was a shock even more intense than its predecessor. Along with the jolt, a loud crackling was heard. And as you may know from my previous videos, a crackling sound when radiation is involved is probably not a good thing. As a result of this second blast, the radiation felt as if his hand had been torn off. He banged on the door of the room until the operator finally let him out. A physician was called into the room and an intense erythema was seen in the area. The patient was sent home. He was thought to have somehow experienced a minor electric shock. But, as you have probably gathered, this wasn't the case. Sending the man home was a grave mistake. The patient had in fact received a huge dose of radiation. It measured between 16,500 and 25,000 rads. This dose was delivered in just a fraction of a second and on an area of skin around a quarter of an inch squared. Treatment of the man continued, but things kept getting worse. He terrifyingly experienced paralysis of the left arm, nausea and vomiting, and he was hospitalised for radiation-induced myelitis of the spinal cord. His legs, mid-diaphragm and vocal cords also ended up being paralysed. The man survived for five agonising months, before finally his time on this earth came to an end the cause being a massive radiation overdose. Less than a month later, on April the 11th, 1986, the same operator was back at work. This time, a patient needed treatment for a facial skin cancer. Once more, the Therac 25 monitor showed the malfunction 54 message. The treatment was administered and again that dreadful sound was heard. The terrifying crackle of radiation out of control. The patient felt a searing, burning sensation. And by this stage, you can probably guess, they received a violent blast of radiation directly into their head. Due to this, the patient ultimately lost their battle on May the 1st of the same year. His autopsy revealed critical radiation-induced damage to the right temporal lobe and brainstem. The medical facility and AECL needed to replicate the error that had occurred. If they could do that, they could stop this from happening to anyone else. It was discovered that rapid data entry could have reproduced the error, but AECL initially couldn't replicate this event. Back at the Yakima Valley Memorial Hospital, now on January the 17th, 1987, another patient was in a treatment room preparing for their therapy. The operator fired a test dose of radiation using film verification. This shows the field affected by the radiation blast. Adjustments were then made to the aperture and it was ready for treatment. But when the operator hit the B key, the machine stopped after 5 seconds. It displayed a fleeting error message. The operator entered the treatment room to make some manual adjustments to the turntable. They then returned to the controls of the Therac 25. Treatment could now finally begin. P was entered onto the device to proceed with the treatment. The patient could be heard through the intercom system. However, their words could not be made out. A dose of radiation was delivered but once more it was far greater than was prescribed. In fact, it was around 100 times greater. The patient felt a severe burning sensation, and then came the reddening of the skin. Within hours, they developed physical burns. In reality, he had received between 8 and 10,000 rats instead of just 86. 
This patient survived for around three months until his time on this earth came to an end. His family settled out of court. In many tales of tragedy, there is a hero. And in this case, it is a man named Fritz Hager. He was a diligent star physicist at the East Texas Cancer Center in Tyler, Texas. After the second incident at the facility, Fritz was resolute in his mission to uncover the truth. In both cases that took place at the facility, the Therac 25 displayed the cryptic Malfunction 54 message. This error code was strangely not mentioned in the manual. AECL later explained that it meant the computer was essentially confused. It couldn't determine if there was an overdose or underdose of radiation. Now remember, the same radiotherapy technician had been involved in both incidents at the center, so Fritz brought the technician back into the control room. They endeavored to not leave the room until the problem was solved. This could well save lives. With a technician running the machine, after hours of testing and retesting every possible combination of actions, they finally pinpointed the issue. The VT100 console used for entering Therac 25 radiation prescriptions allowed cursor movement via up and down keys. If the user selected X-ray mode, the machine would begin setting up for high-powered X-rays, a process that took around 8 seconds. If the user switched to electron mode within those 8 seconds, the turntable wouldn't switch over correctly, leaving it in an unknown state. All prior testing had been slow and careful, as one would expect. However, due to the nature of this error, that type of testing was totally inadequate. It simply never would have created the combination of actions needed, nor within the time span they needed to occur in. It took someone who worked with the machine daily to find the error. Finally, Fritz could demonstrate how to produce Malfunction 54 at will. But even with this smoking gun, the ability to recreate the error, convincing AECL would be more of a challenge. It took numerous phone calls, along with multiple detailed fax reports, before the company could replicate the behavior in their own machine. The code used within the Therac 25 machine was brought under the microscope. Further testing, pushed along by ongoing lawsuits, showed just how serious this issue was. Upon testing, the software was shown to be so inadequate that it could even blow fuses on the Therac 25 under certain conditions. The code was proven to not just be badly written and poorly documented, but to be dangerous to the highest degree. The Therac 25 software was a ticking time bomb, and it had already claimed several victims. But now, at least, it would claim no more. 